Bibles, if you would, this morning to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 5 is where we'll take our main text from this morning. 2 Samuel chapter 5. It's good to be back in God's house. Uh, as the psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I trust you uh, got up this morning with that attitude as well, that today's the day that we go to God's house. And to be excited about that, look forward to that. We're thankful for those of you that are visiting with us this morning as well. That thrills our hearts that you've come, and we trust we could welcome you. Before I read the verse of Scripture, I saw something this morning. Uh, I ordinarily don't spend a lot of time just looking at the news on Sunday morning, and today was no exception. But I always do like to at least check it to see if there's anything, uh, I guess, of great importance that has happened during the night that I need to know about. And so I was looking at the news this morning, and... I just uh, pulled it up on the computer and I saw a headline and so it caught my attention and I, I clicked on it and read a, a story real quick and uh, I thought I would share this with you. Uh, I think every one of you are probably familiar with the restaurant Chick-fil-A and uh, most of you probably know that the man who started Chick-fil-A was a Christian man by the name of S. Truett Cathy, if, if I have that correct. And uh, he started that company many, many years ago. I believe he lived in the Georgia area around Atlanta. And uh, I think you probably know some of the things that the company stands for. And one of the things that uh, certainly that they have stuck to down through the years is the decision not to open on Sunday. And uh, I heard just recently that uh, their sales, Chick-fil-A's daily sales, are the highest of any fast food restaurant in the world. And you see how the Lord has blessed them for doing that. But having the, the point I want to get to in the story is this, that most of you know that tonight is the Super Bowl and it's being played in Atlanta. And uh, Chick-fil-A sponsors a lot of the events that, college football events and things that take place there. At the, it was the Georgia Dome. They built a new stadium there. I believe the Mercedes-Benz Dome, now they call it. But uh, there is a Chick-fil-A that's located inside of that stadium. And uh, they have never opened on Sunday. We know that Atlanta Falcons play there, and they play on Sunday. And Chick-fil-A just doesn't open that restaurant inside of that building, even though there's an event going on, and they can make a lot of money. But today's the Super Bowl, right? But guess what? Not going to be open today either. Amen. I said that to say this, that the, the convictions and the principles that we have out of the Word of God shouldn't be changed just because of circumstances, should they? And I think that's a good example to us. No matter how important something might be in the world's eyes, or no matter how much of an opportunity it might look like for us to get ahead, or to, whether it be to make money or have success, that we must stand on the convictions that we have that are built upon the standards and that are built upon the principles that are taught in the Word of God. And that was a blessing to me. I hope that even through that, that people could be encouraged to stand upon the principles of God's Word. 2 Samuel chapter 5, let's begin reading in verse 17. We'll read down through the end of this chapter. 2 Samuel chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. I'll give you a minute to get there. I told you to turn, then I started telling a story. All right, verse 17. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David. And David heard of it and went down to the hold. Let's just take this verse by verse for just a minute and uh, rather than read it and try to go back through it again. Uh, notice here that there are some things that take place in this chapter that I didn't mention. There's very important events that take place in this chapter. One event, is you, if you go back and read, I won't take time to do it, but if you go back and read toward the beginning of this chapter that David is made king over all the nation of Israel. When I say of all Israel, I'm talking about all 12 tribes. We know that many years ago, or previous to this account, that uh, Samuel had gone to Bethlehem to the house of Jesse, and he had anointed David privately. And uh, that even though David knew that it was God's will for him to be the king, he had to wait many years. Saul, we know Saul uh, chased after him. Saul tried to kill him. David was on the run. He was a fugitive for many years. Uh, then Saul died. When Saul died, that David was appointed over, he was anointed publicly in the city of Hebron over the tribe of Judah. And uh, yet that uh, Ishbosheth was the one who was anointed 
uh, king over the other tribes of Israel. But now we see that the nation of Israel has been united. That David is, uh, he's anointed publicly in Hebron over all 12 tribes. But not only, not only that, but you find in this chapter that they, there was a great conquest that was made by the nation of Israel not long after David became the king. It said there was a city, and it was known as the stronghold of Zion. We know it as the city of Jerusalem. And it was uh, not long after that that David was anointed that, that they went and they took the stronghold of Zion, from, I believe, from the Jebusites. And, and it became the city of David, the city of Jerusalem. And uh, that's an important event. One day Jerusalem will be the capital of the world, won't it? For a thousand years, Jerusalem will be the capital of the world. It's not going to be Washington, D.C. It's not going to be Moscow. Uh, it's not going to be London. It won't be any, any of those places. But Christ will sit on the throne of David. And he'll reign, rule and reign from the city of Jerusalem. And of course, we know that one day that this earth will be destroyed. There'll be a new heaven, a new earth. There'll be a holy city, a new Jerusalem come down from God out of heaven. So that's important that the city of Jerusalem was taken. We go on and we read prior to this that David is growing. He's growing in strength. Uh, the, the, the nation of Israel is doing well. Uh, they are just, uh, they're united. And many good things are taking place there. But we just read in verse 17 that when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David. You see, uh, bad news travels fast, but good news does travel. It doesn't travel as fast, but it does travel. The Philistines were a nation of people that lived next to the, the nation of Israel. They lived over along the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. And they knew what was going on in the nation of Israel. They had been a thorn in the side of, of God's people for a long time, and they continue to be uh, for a period of time after this. But when they heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, I want you to notice the statement that's made in verse 17. It said, all the Philistines came up to seek David. Now, they came to seek David. Don't think that they came to seek David to bring him gifts or to congratulate him for being the king or to have a, some kind of a summit or to, have some sort, or to attend some sort of a dinner, a state dinner. No, they came to seek David for one reason, and that was to kill him. They had a desire to get rid of him because it was in their best interest. Not God's interest, but their interest. Because they were afraid that the stronger Israel gets, the weaker that we're going to get, and uh, we may lose our land, we may lose our kingdom, we may lose all of these things. And it says this, that when David heard of it, that he went down to the hold. The hold there be a stronghold or a fortress, a place of security. When David heard that the Philistines were coming. Let's read on. Verse 18. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Now, I'm not real familiar with the valley of Rephaim. I've never been uh, to the nation of Israel. But I had to go back and as I, as I went back and studied the valley of Rephaim, I made the statement just a minute ago that the Philistines lived along the seacoast. Israel was a bit inland. It was in the hills. The valley of Rephaim was a valley that it didn't stretch all the way from Jerusalem to the Philistines territory, but it did go part of the way. There was a brook or a stream that flowed through that valley. And so it was a natural passageway for the Philistines to come at least and get near Jerusalem. And so that's where they came. They stretched themselves. It said they spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. So they're, they're coming. David knows they're coming. They're getting close. But then we read in verse 19 that David inquired of the Lord. Now, David was the king, but he understood that I'm not a sovereign king, that I have one that's above me. David, that he has to understand, as Joshua had to understand, as the angel of the Lord would appear before him and let him know that, that I'm the captain of the host, that you listen to me. David understood that while I'm the king, there's one above me, and I need to seek him. I need to seek his, um, not only his opinion, because God doesn't have an opinion, God's um, his word is fact, it's truth. So, but David inquired of the Lord, and notice what he says here in verse 19. He asked the Lord this question, shall I go up to the Philistines? Here they're coming in, and I'm in the hold, but should I go? What should I do? And so the Lord would answer him. The Lord said unto David, go up. That word just means attack. Yes, the answer is a positive answer. Shall I go up? Yes. Move forward. Uh, go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. That's God's word, and uh, we know that God's word is God's faithful and true to his word. So he says, you go, and I'm going to give you the victory. And I want you to notice in verse 20, And David came to Baal-perazim, and David smote them there. 
and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. That David did exactly what the Lord told him to do. He went forward. He, uh, Brother Wade, I believe from the way we read this, I don't believe that there would be any argument. He met him head on, didn't he? He just went. And God gave him a great victory. And uh, I want you to notice how it's described here. And when David said, when he was describing what happened, he said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as a breach of waters. I mention that because... Just a few weeks ago, we were reminded, or y'all were up here, what a breach of waters does. He's talking about a, 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 a dam that's breached. Water goes over the top. Water washes it out. And we saw what great damage that did, even around here a few weeks ago, did it not? You think about anything that stood in the way of that was destroyed, wasn't it? He said, that's how the Lord destroyed the Philistines. It was as a breach of waters as a dam would, would, would collapse, as it would fail, and everything would be instantly destroyed. And therefore, verse, the end of verse 20, therefore he called the name of that place Baal Perazim, which means master of breaches. That's what it means. He's uh, memorializing that place. Verse 21, and there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. The Philistines came with their gods, didn't they? They brought their gods with them. But Brother Kyle, they couldn't help them. And uh, so when David found the images that he and his men destroyed them. Now let's go to verse 22. I want to take our thought out of these next four verses. The reason I spent some time with the previous verses is because they go together. Beginning in verse 22. And the Philistines came up yet again. Yet again. How did they come up? They came the same way. And spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. You see they came to the same place. Evidently maybe the same tactics. And when David inquired of the Lord, David did the same thing. It's almost like a rerun of what we just read. David again inquires of the Lord. And he said, thou shalt not go up. Different message from God this time. Thou shalt not go up. He said, but fetch a compass behind them. Now, we don't use that wording uh, much today. I guess I've never heard anybody make this statement. I'm going to fetch a compass. It's, it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm going to go get a compass. It means that we're going to make a loop. We're going to go around them. Uh, that, that we're going uh, to encircle them. We're going to, in other words, that you think about maybe going around the compass, going around the outside of that. We're going to make a big loop and get to the other side of where we are now. So the Lord said, don't go up, but you fetch a compass behind them. In other words, you make a loop and go behind them. And it says, I want you to come up upon them over against the mulberry trees. So he says, you go around to... Don't, don't, don't come to the front side, but you go around behind them, and evidently there was a grove of mulberry trees back there. Uh, I like mulberries. I, like, I really like mulberry jelly, by the way. Uh, it's really good. But uh, nevertheless, verse 24, the Lord said this, And let it be when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, then thou shalt bestir thyself. So the Lord told David, said, take your men, go back behind the Philistines, go over against the mulberry trees, and uh, you just stay there. Just wait. And he said, uh, you're going to hear a sound of a going or a marching. That's what the word going means. You're going to listen for a sound. He said, when you hear this marching and this going in the tops of the mulberry trees, I don't know how tall they were. I don't know if their mulberry trees are exactly like our mulberry trees are here. Probably not. Probably a little different. But he said, you just listen. And when you hear the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, he said, then you're going to move. That's what the word bestir means. He said, then I want you to move. For then the Lord goeth out... For then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord had commanded him and smote the Philistines from Geba, Geba until thou come to Gezer. Now you may wonder where I'm going this morning or what I want to try to get across to you what's on my heart this morning. And I'm going to be honest with you. I try to be honest with you. I always try to. I don't, I don't enjoy preaching what I'm about to preach to you this morning. And it's not because that I don't like the topic or it's not because I don't like the examples I use or anything like that. I want to tell you this morning, the reason I don't enjoy preaching, what I'm going to preach to you this morning is because I haven't mastered it. I've not come to the place uh, that uh, I've learned to completely do 
what I'm going to preach to us this morning. And therefore, that's hard for me to preach to you. And so I want you to understand that. I'm preaching to me. Listen, as, even from this morning, as, as I was up early and I was reading and, and studying through this, the Lord's already spoke to my heart. I've already got the message. And I pray that in, in these next few minutes that I can get it across to you. And I, pr I ask you to pray for me that uh, certainly that as I preach to you this morning that uh, I could be a better example to you, that I could do that that I preach unto you. Because it's hard to preach something knowing that you struggle with it yourself. But this morning I want us to think about a simple thought. It's not a thought that's new. It's nothing you've never heard before. But it's on my heart this morning. And I want us to think about waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord. Now, in the passage that we just read, that God was testing David. And God was reminding David that he was still in control. Think about this. You think about what we just went over, the two accounts that we just read and I talked about. That the first time that the Philistines came, they came to the Valley of Rephaim. David knew they were coming. He went to the hold. He inquired of the Lord. The Lord gave him the answer. Here's what I want you to do. You meet him head on. And he said, I'm going to go before you, and I'm going to give you the victory. And God did exactly what he told David he would do. And David was faithful. He was obedient to God in doing it. Think about this now. Think about this. Really ponder on this for a second. If you were David, and not long after that happened, here they come again. They come the same route. They come with the same, it looks like, you know, they're bringing the same weapons against us. They don't have a new plan. In other words, we've been there. We've done that. What's old saying? We've got the t-shirt. This is old hat. Would not it have been so easy for David this time to just say, well, here's how we did it last time. This got us the victory last time. I don't have to inquire of the Lord. I don't have to seek after God. I can do this. I agree. I believe we could all say this morning, if we'd be honest with ourselves, we would have struggled with that very thing, would we not? That let's just go do it like we did the time before. But David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord said, no, I want you to do things differently this time. Uh, you reckon that the Philistines may have, this may have been part of their strategy? Let's go the same way we went last time. Let's come. That looks like we're going to do the same thing. We're in the same place. And then when they come upon us, that we're going to make some, some drastic maneuvers. We're going to trap them. I, I believe the Philistines had something up their sleeves. I really do. And of course, God knew about all that. But I want you to notice, go back to verse... Uh, 23 of this chapter it said and when the Lord or when David inquired of the Lord he said thou shalt not go up but fetch a compass behind them and come upon them over against the mulberry trees the Lord tells David no don't, don't go ahead don't go up but you make that big loop you make that circle and you go and get behind them you get behind the mulberry trees and what did the Lord tell him to do you just wait right there. Just don't, just wait. I don't know how many mulberry trees there were. I don't think it was just two or three. Let me tell you the picture I have in my mind of this. David's captain of the host is who? Joab? He's his leader? Captain of the army? I believe as David and Joab is and the army, you see, the Phil I believe the Philistines had their mind, they had their eyes straight ahead. They're looking at Jerusalem, or looking toward Jerusalem. I'm not saying they never turned around to look, but I believe all their reconnaissance was going that way. And David and his men went way around. And they get there, and they're behind the mulberry trees. And I, I just think in my mind, by the way, that at times that Joab might have just sort of looked out around those mulberry trees and he looked out there at the Philistines and they're all facing the other way and they're unprepared for battle. I 
just think the thoughts must have had to go through Joab's mind that, boy, let's go now. Look at them. They have no idea we're going to catch them totally off guard. You know, they're, maybe they're, all of their eyes, all their reconnaissance is that way. Come on, David, let's go. And David had to say, no. We've been told to wait. We're to wait. You ever been in a situation like that? All the earthly wisdom, human wisdom said, go, do it. Move forward. And yet, God's telling you, just, well, just wait. Just wait. And go, let's go to verse 24. This was the message that God gave to David. He said, let it be when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees. Just, just stay here. Don't worry about what they're doing. Don't try to use your knowledge and your wisdom and your prowess and your military intelligence. Don't try to do any of that. But you just stay here. And when you see the tops of those mulberry trees begin to sway, begin to move, he said, well, said that's your sign. You go then. You move forward. He said, putting this in my words, he said that that sound of that going that you see in the mulberry trees is me going before you. And he said, I'll go out before them and I'll smite the host of the Philistines. Verse 25 said, David did so as the Lord had commanded him. And he smote the Philistines from Geba, Geba until thou come to Gezer. Now, we don't know exactly how the battle went down. I don't know if the Lord went out ahead of them and sort of drove them back into the army of David. I, have, I don't know. It's not important. But I know this, that when they heard the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, they had complete confidence that that's the Lord. And God gave them the victory, didn't he? But they had to wait upon the Lord. Go to the book of Acts, if you would. I want to try to tie this together. Acts chapter 1. Keep, just keep what we just talked about in your mind. But they waited for the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees. Acts chapter 1. We know that as Jesus would prepare to go back to the Father, to to be restored to that glory that he once had with the Father, that he gave the disciples some instructions. In Acts chapter 1, verse 1, Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. He, he said, I've, I've written the one book. He said, I'm going to write another one. I'm, I'm writing this to you. Until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, notice what he did. He commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. But wait. Don't go out and do anything. He said, you need to wait. Wait here. Uh, one of the other gospel writers uses the phrase, that you tarry here until you be endued with power from on high. This is, you wait here, don't depart, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not, not many days hence. So Jesus tells them to wait. Don't get in a hurry, but wait. And there's a period of time there from the time that Jesus, and if I understand it correctly, that it was only about, really about 10 days from when Jesus ascended uh, back to the Father until the day of Pentecost. It was a 50-day period from his resurrection, but just a 10-day period after his ascension. He told them to stay right where they are. And go over to chapter 2 of the book of Acts. It says in verse 1 that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Definitely in obedience to what Christ had told them. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost 
and began to speak with other, with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We know that on the day of Pentecost, that's when the Holy Ghost came and he baptized, he indwelled the believers. He baptized them, uh, or baptized uh, the church there on the day of Pentecost. And it says here that the visible sign of the coming of the Holy Spirit uh, that day was what? It was a rushing, mighty wind. There suddenly there came the sound from heaven as of a rushing, mighty wind that filled all the house where they were sitting. If you were to go back to John chapter 3, and I'm not going to turn over there and read it, but as Jesus spoke with, with that Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus, that religious leader, he spoke of the work of the Holy Spirit. And there that he spoke of the work of the Holy Spirit as the wind, didn't he? He said, the wind bloweth where it listeth. He said, and we don't know where it comes or where it's going. He says, so is everyone uh, that is born of the Spirit. And I think that's speaking of the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. We can't predict it. That in God's time that he sends the convicting power of the Holy Spirit uh, among those that are unsaved. And yet there comes a time if they reject that the Holy Spirit moves on. And I'm not saying he can't. He certainly can uh, deal with many people at one time. He can go on somewhere else. And so here we see the Holy Spirit it's likened to that wind, likened to the wind here on the day of Pentecost. And so as I think back to where we were back in the book of 2 Samuel concerning uh, David and his men, what was that that they were to wait for? They were to wait for the sound of a, a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, weren't they? I believe that sound of a going was the wind that was there. I believe that's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And certainly as God's people, that we are to do just that, are we not? That we are to wait for the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We're to wait until we get that assurance from God before we move, before we act. That the Holy Spirit is the one who lets us know when to move, to know how to move, to know where to move, to know what to do. He's that one that stands beside us. And he always speaks of the word of God. He'll never guide you in the wrong way. If you ever wonder, I know there's times that the Bible says to try the spirits. There's times that we are unsure about things. But one of the ways that you can know of a surety that the spirit that you're led of is not the Holy Spirit is if you're led to do something apart from the word of God. The spirit will never lead you to do something apart from the word of God. Go, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let's tie, try to tie all this together this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> so when you think about waiting on God, the Lord told David, you just go there and wait. No matter what you see, no matter what you hear, if you peek around the mulberry trees and the whole camp's asleep, They've got their weapons in a pile. Don't go. But you wait. Just wait on me. When you hear the sound of the going in the tops of the mulberry trees, he said, then it's time. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let's read the first two verses of Scripture here. Paul said, writing to Timothy, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Not only in our lives are we to wait on the Lord, but Paul here, as he writes to Timothy, he says, as a preacher, as a man of God, you're going to have to wait on the Lord. You teach. Notice what he said in verse 2. He said, Preach the word. Just preach the word. You don't have to come up with something new. You don't have to uh, try to manipulate people. He said, just preach the word. And he said, you be instant. You be instant in season. You be instant out of season. He said, reprove, rebuke, exhort. You do all of those things that I've given you to do. But notice how he said to do it. He said to do it with all long suffering and doctrine. He said, don't turn from the truth. Don't turn to fables. Don't forsake the doctrine of the Word of God. But he said, you teach that. And he said, you teach with all long suffering. 
In other words, he told Timothy, you're going to have to teach, and then you're going to have to wait. You're going to have to wait. This morning, we cannot force people to receive God's word, can we? I can't force you to receive it. Brother Johnny was mentioned in Sunday school this morning concerning uh, Paul, I believe it was to the Colossians, that he would make the state or yeah, he would make the statement to them concerning the fact uh, that, that he carried a great load in his heart for them. Spoke, spoke of agonizing on their behalf. And listen, there's times that I, I know exactly what he's talking about. I agonize for, for you. I agonize for the members of the church. I agonize over God's people. But I can't take people and beat them over the head with the word of God. It won't work, will it? He said, you've got to teach. You've got to preach. You've got to keep doing what you're doing. And you've got to just wait on God. Because what he's saying is that when the Word of God is taught, the Word of God has the power to go to the heart, doesn't it? God can take it to the heart. But it might not be overnight. It might not be that those changes that need to be made in the lives of the church members or even in the church, it may not be that all of those things are going to take place this week. He says, you continue to teach. You do it with all long suffering. Do it with patience. And wait on the Lord. You know where a lot of ministers get in trouble? You know where a lot of churches get in trouble? Trying to force things. And I'm not going to turn back and read it for time's sake. But back in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 13, the Philistines had come and they had brought a great force against the nation of Israel and Saul was the king. And it said that Saul looked up and he saw, he saw this great force that was come up he saw they were outnumbered. And it said the people were afraid. They were going hiding in caves. Some of them were going into another country. They were forsaking him. And, and days went by. It said seven days went by. And Samuel was, was supposed to come. And he was supposed to come as, as the priest and, and offer a sacrifice. And that Saul waited and he waited. And Samuel never came. And it said the people trembled. And they were afraid. What will we do? And what did Saul do? He stepped out of the place. And he, he made this statement to Samuel. He said, I forced myself to make a sacrifice unto the Lord. You know what Samuel told him? He said, that was foolish. Because that's not your place. You're not a priest. And that was the beginning of the end for King Saul, wasn't it? When he forced something. I've been guilty of forcing things before. You ever been guilty of forcing something? Making something happen? And it never ends well, does it? Why? Because it wasn't God's time. To come to the place to just wait upon the Lord. I want to just give you a couple of scriptures real quick. Psalm chapter 130. Let's go to the Psalms and then we'll close. Psalm 130. There's so much in the Bible about waiting on the Lord. I, we could spend days and days, weeks and weeks studying it. That wouldn't be prudent this morning. But I do want to just remind you of some statements that the psalmist makes here in the psalm. <clears throat> psalm chapter 130, verses 5 and 6. The psalmist said, I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. You see, that was the reason why David was able to wait, because he wasn't waiting for something that he just hoped would happen. He was waiting for God to do what he said that he would do. That makes, it, that makes a difference. He said, I'm putting my trust in his word. I'm putting my confidence in him. And then he made the statement in verse 6. He said, My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. 
I say more than they that watch for the morning. Now you think about the waiting for the morning. Probably all of you can remember at some time that you waited for the morning. You waited for the sun to come up. Uh, I know a lot of times that people that are very, very sick seem like sometimes as you maybe you lay there and, and uh, you're just so, so sick, you just make, oh, if it could just get morning. Wait for the morning. But the psalmist said here, he said, I wait for the Lord more than they that watch and wait for the morning. You know, when we wait on the Lord to fulfill his promise, it's just as sure as it is waiting on the morning. It's going to come. Says, I do that. David knew what it was to have to wait on the Lord. Many times, many examples we could look at in his life that he waited on the Lord. David made this statement in Psalm chapter 40. Listen to what he said in verse 1 of Psalm chapter 40. And uh, I, want to, I want to ask us the question. Psalm chapter 40, verse 1. David said, I waited patiently for the Lord. Ask yourself the question, am I waiting patiently for the Lord? Or am I trying to force things? Am I trying to get ahead of the Lord? Am I trying to do things my own way? He said, I waited patiently for him. And he said, he inclined his ear unto me and he heard my cry. And he did that exactly that he said he would do. But he said, I waited patiently. I waited patiently. He made the statement in Psalm 18, verse 30. He says, for God, his way is perfect. We need to be reminded of that, don't we? As for God, his way is perfect. His time is perfect. His word is perfect. Sometimes we just have to learn to wait. The Lord told David, he said, go over to the mulberry trees and wait right there. And again, I know it's not written down. I'm not adding something to the Word of God. But no doubt that it included in that, that David, no matter what you see over there, no matter what time that it looks like that this is the time to go, just wait. And when you hear the sound of the going in the mulberry trees, then you'll know it's time. And then you can go. Young people, you can save a lot of trouble in your life if you'll wait on the Lord. There's so many times that, that young people do things, whether it's be, you know, getting married, whether it be going into a career, a lot of choices, that you, a lot of important choices that you have to make. They don't wait on the Lord, they force things. And because of that, they get into horrible situations. They cause them grief the rest of their life. I would encourage you to wait on the Lord. Don't worry about what everybody else says. Don't worry about that it seems like that that's the wrong thing to do, that I'm missing opportunities. Wait on Him. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you can know what God's will is for your life. I know I didn't quote that exactly, but that's the essence of the verse. Waiting on the Lord. And then when the Lord says to go, what do we need to do? We need to go. That's the thing. Don't go in front of him, but don't lag behind him. Wait on him. And when you hear the sound of the going in the tops of the mulberry trees, when, when, when you're assured by the Spirit of God that it's time to go, then go. Let's ask for a song this morning. If you'd have anything upon your heart, any burden, any prayer request, any way the church is known to receive members, any way we can help you.